Today's reading is 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 28. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? And I, am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman, and Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. And the Lord God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up along with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord of Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. If you're a Christian, you should probably thank your mom. This was the title of 
an article from the May-June issue of Christianity Today magazine. The article is reporting on a 2023 study by the American Bible Society. It found that the active faith of mothers is a strong predictor of religious transmission. The fact is that the majority of believers remain in the same religious tradition as their mothers. Now, outside of today's passage, we have other examples of that in the Bible. For example, the Apostle Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Two generations of mothers, three generations of faith. Now, pointing this out, the study and the scripture, friends, we need to remember that there's no guarantees. There are no guarantees and no promises made in scripture or in life. The Bible doesn't offer us, as frustrating as it is, it doesn't offer us a formula that guarantees your children will grow up to love and to follow Jesus. Because our children are independent agents. You learn that quickly, don't you? They're independent agents, and once they're grown friends, they're free to make their own decisions. And so even the most devout and faithful mother may have a child grow up to walk away from the faith. The point that the study makes and that the scripture makes is that while there are no guarantees, a mother can have a tremendous influence on the faith of her children. And that's what we see today in the account of Hannah. Now, last week, we officially concluded our study through Matthew's gospel. And this week, we're unofficially beginning a new series through the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. Now, I look forward to doing this study. I look forward to seeing uh, together God's action as he raises up for Israel King David. And what might we learn about God and who he is from these accounts that we'll find However, we're not going to officially begin the study until the end of June, June 30th to be exact. June 30th will begin that. And why won't we begin till June 30th? Because between now and June 30th, we've got a lot going on. See, after this week, the next six Sundays will find us alternating between guest speakers. And I've chosen some Psalms of King David so that we can get to know him before we read his origin story in 1 Samuel. So next week, May 19th, we're going to study Psalm 139. Now, the cool part about this is for those of you who are participating in the scripture memory program that we've been doing together as a church, we're memorizing Psalm 139 over the course of the next two months, just memorizing three or so verses at a time and making our way through the entire psalm. But we're going to study that psalm together next week. Then on May 26th, we're going to hear from our missionaries, Jonathan and Fazia Young of United World Missions, who will be here to share with us. And the following Sunday, June 2nd, we're going to go back to the Psalms and study another Psalm of King David, Psalm 145, which is a Psalm of worship and praise. And then we'll have a missionary update on June 9th, where we will hear from Tim and Lisa Murdoch, who minister with Central Africa Baptist University in Kitwe, Zambia. And that will be a wonderful time with them. And then June 16th is Father's Day, and we're going to study one final psalm of David, Psalm 18. And so we'll talk about that together on Father's Day. And then on June the 23rd, I'm going to be gone. I have been asked to chaperone the Camden Hills Regional High School, Washington, D.C. trip with the junior class. So Abigail and I and about a hundred something other teenagers and other adults will be somewhere in Washington, D.C. on Sunday, June the 23rd. And so we have asked Tom Oates, who was supposed to speak to us back in January but was snowed out, we've asked him to come and to speak on that Sunday, June 23rd. And finally, June 30th, we will officially begin our study of 1 Samuel. So as you can see, these next six, six weeks, we have a lot of exciting things. A lot of exciting things together as we look ahead. But today is Mother's Day. And so as Mother's Day, I thought it was appropriate for us to kind of preemptively start our study of 1 Samuel because the book of 1 Samuel begins with a mother. The book of 1 Samuel begins with a mother, or actually more properly, it begins with a woman who really desires to be a mother. 
we meet a woman named Hannah, and the Hebrew name Hannah means grace or gift. And, and most of you know my youngest daughter, we named her Hannah, and we gave her the middle name Grace, so her name is actually Grace Grace. Because by number four, you need a lot of grace. No. In the biblical account, Hannah is married to a man by the name of Elkanah. And we find in verse 1, the fact that we're given Elkanah's genealogy tells us that this man was somebody. And we'll talk about that when we introduce 1 Samuel. Verse 2 tells us that Elkanah had two wives, so that means he was financially secure, because you had to be financially secure. Verse 3 tells us that Elkanah went up regularly to worship, which means he was devout. He was devout in his devotion, following the Lord. And verses 4 through 8 record that Elkanah treated Hannah with, and in her plight with gentleness. He, he was truly, it seems, a good man. And so while everything in the story seems good, we find that Hannah's story begins where so many other biblical stories begin, and that is in barrenness. In fact, Hannah's inability to conceive children may have been the reason why Elkanah had a second wife. You know, this is what happened with Sarai and Abram in Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16, starting in verse 2, Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, that it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. So Abraham had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. And Abram went into Hagar. She conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And in the same way, it could be that Hannah was Elkanah's first wife, which is why she's listed first, but because she was unable to conceive, Elkanah married Peninnah because Hannah was unable. And then, as happened with Sarah and Hagar, as soon as the second wife began bearing children, she looked with contempt upon the first wife. Now, understand, the Old Testament regularly describes the occasion of polygamy. Samuel, you can pull that scripture down. We're not there yet. The Old Testament regularly describes polygamy. Now, polygamy was very common practice in the ancient world, and while it could provide social and financial protection for women and children who had no rights and no social safety net, the Bible describes the practice of polygamy, but it makes clear every time it describes the practice, it describes the problems, the animosity, and the jealousy that always accompany the practice. So friends, what we find is the Old Testament describes polygamy, but it does not prescribe or celebrate polygamy, because polygamy is not the way it's supposed to be. While it was an almost universal practice at that time, and it was allowed at that time in the same way that slavery was allowed at that time, we find that the clear teaching of Scripture eventually undid both of those practices. And every single time we find polygamy practiced in the Old Testament, we find a record of exactly what we see in today's account. We see envy, we see rivalry, and we see discord. And this is clearly a sensitive topic for Hannah because she was unable to conceive. And Penina, her rival, mocked her. And it was so painful because Hannah was unable to do something that women are uniquely created to do. Now, friends, I'm going to make a controversial statement here. Men and women are different. Men and women are biologically determined. Men and women are not interchangeable. And since I'm on a roll, only biological men can be fathers and only biological women can be mothers because only women can have babies. Now, friends, those statements aren't actually controversial. It's not bigotry. Those statements are biology. Now, this is reality. The reality is that God has uniquely designed women to be able to do something that no man can or will ever be able to do. A woman can grow life in her body. A woman can birth life through her body. A woman can feed life from her body. 
God has uniquely and incredibly designed women to grow birth and nurture life in a way that men never can and never will be able to do. And making this observation, friends, it doesn't mean that bearing and nurturing children is all that a woman can or should do. What I'm saying is that it's tragic. It's tragic that we live in a culture that is actively telling women that their real value comes from their financial contribution or their contribution in the marketplace, and that childbearing or childrearing is at best a distraction from the truly important work of career. And maybe later, once you've done the really important things, and once you've achieved in your career, and once you make some money and worldly influence, then if you have time, you can do that cute little have a few kids thing. Friends, understand that women have made and will continue to make incredible contributions in the marketplace, the boardroom, the classroom, the lab, and the legislature. However, to treat a woman's unique ability to grow, bear, and nurture children, to treat it as at best an inconvenience or a distraction from the other truly important work a woman might do, childbearing and childrearing is not all a woman can do, but it is something that a woman can uniquely do. For only women are designed by God to do that. And shouldn't that tell us something? It should tell us that motherhood is not actually a distraction. It's part of the design. It should tell us that childbearing is not a fluke in the system, but a feature of the system. And as such, for those who struggled with infertility, as Hannah did, they can tell you the pain of being unable to do something which God has uniquely created women to be able to do and seems to come so easily to so many. But the problem is we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world where our bodies don't always work the way they should, and that causes grief and sadness like we see in Hannah. And this grief is only compounded by the taunting of a rival, Peninnah. Now, note in verse 6 that it specifically says, and Hannah's rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And, and we're going to read later on in, in verses 19 and 20 that it says the Lord remembered Hannah, and so she conceived and bore a son. And so I want to make an observation about this barrenness that she had. These statements don't mean that every case of barrenness then or now are by God's direct intervention. We affirm that God is sovereign over all and that all of his purposes will always stand. However, to say that God is sovereign does not make him guilty for the harm that you suffered at the hand of your abuser. To say that God is sovereign does not make him the one who starts every pebble rolling that begins every avalanche. To say that God is sovereign does not make God the one who personally mutates every healthy cell into a cancer cell. To say that God is sovereign does not mean that God directly intervenes to cause every case of infertility. To say that God is sovereign recognizes the mystery that exists in the relationship of creator and his creation. Because while God has created all things good, humanity rebelled. So now humanity uses its freedom often in rebellion against and opposition to the will of God. Because of our rebellion and how sin has affected our world, weather and the created order no longer perfectly submit to God's good design, to the pattern that the Creator created. Now the human body no longer perfectly acts, reproduces, heals, grows in conformity to the good and healthy patterns established by God. Friends, the point is that God is sovereign. He will always perfectly fulfill His purposes and accomplish His plans. However, there is a mystery that exists between God's sovereignty, human responsibility, and sinful tragedy. And I say this so you understand that today's narrative is not teaching us that every single instance of barrenness that you might encounter is because of the direct intervention of God. What this narrative does reveal is that in Hannah's case, the Lord was directly involved. And the only reason why we know that is because God chose to reveal it to us. Church, understand that when we're trying to comprehend and make sense of a narrative portion of Scripture, note what is revealed and note what remains concealed. Note what is revealed and note what is concealed. Because what's clearly revealed to us by the Lord is for us. 
What's come sealed is not for us. And it's clearly revealed in this passage that in the case of Hannah, God had a direct hand in Hannah's barrenness and her eventual pregnancy. However, we read the biblical narrative, we should be careful about filling in the blanks when something is not clearly revealed to us in the scripture. It's always dangerous for us when we read narrative in the scripture to start guessing. Well, I bet that happened because God was punishing him. Well, God must have done this because, uh, of course, God allowed that because. Friends, when God is silent, we should remain silent. And this also applies when tragedy strikes your friends. When God is silent, you should remain silent. You know, when we try to comfort those that are hurting, phrases like, maybe God is teaching you a lesson, or I imagine God allowed this because, friends, those phrases are rarely helpful, and they're almost always wrong. So unless God has actually opened heaven and given you a clear and direct revelation, simply sit in the struggle and in the suffering. Remind those who hurt that the Lord is near and assure them of God's never failing love. But in Hannah's case and her struggle and her barrenness, God reveals directly and clearly his hand was at work in Hannah's infertility and in her pregnancy. The Lord was intervening. Why? Because he was accomplishing his purposes through Hannah and through her desires. Because what we find in this account is two desires. Hannah desires a son, and the Lord desires a prophet. Hannah desires a son, and the Lord desires a prophet. And we hear Hannah pray in verse 11. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Hannah promises that if the Lord gives her a son, she'll dedicate her son as a Nazarite. Now, Nazarites were dedicated lay people. Samson, whose story is found in the book of Judges, chapters 13 through 16, was a Nazarite. John the Baptist, who we met in our study through Matthew's gospel, was also a Nazarite. Numbers chapter 6 explains this special vow by which someone might separate themselves and set themselves apart to the service of the Lord, which included not cutting your hair and abstaining from alcohol, among other things. And Hannah prays to the Lord and says, If you give me a son, Lord, I will give him back to you, dedicating him with the Nazarite vow. Now reading that, friends, do not think that our God is some two-bit deity who's easily manipulated. God does not answer Hannah's prayer because you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Friends, God does not need anything from Hannah. God responds to Hannah's prayer according to his plan and his purposes. God's purposes coincide with Hannah's desires. Hannah gets a son and God gets the prophet. Verse 20 declares, And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Samuel is made up of two Hebrew words, Shema, hear, and El, God. Shema Uel, heard by God. Hannah was heard by God. More than that, God had heard the prayer of his people. They needed a prophet. And so God sent a prophet, Shamuel, Samuel, so that his people might hear him. The question was, will they hear him? And that will be borne out in the book of 1 Samuel. This narrative has all sorts of wordplay in the original Hebrew that we miss. You see, the same Hebrew word, Sha'al, is translated petition, asked, and lent, and repeated five times in the response that we find to Hannah's prayer. For example, after observing Hannah's prayer in the temple, the priest says to her in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 17, Eli answers, go in peace, and the Lord of Israel grant your petition, Sha'al, that you have made to him. And so when Hannah returns later on with the child, she quotes this back to him almost word for word in verse 27. 
For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted to me my petition, Sha'al, that I made to him. Friends, she repeats it word for word to make the point. God did exactly as he said he would. God spoke through his priest, he fulfilled his word, and he did it exactly word for word as he said he would. Because, friends, God's word can be trusted. It never fails. And he does exactly as he promised he would do. God promised he heard her petition. He answered the petition in exactly the way that he said he would. And then Hannah uses this same Hebrew word two more times in the very final statement she makes in verse 20, 28. Therefore, I have lent him, that's that word sha'al, to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent sha'al to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. So why am I making the point with this Hebrew word? Because Hannah uses the same Hebrew word. She says, I give to God what I asked of God. I give to God what I asked of God. I asked, he gave, I gave it right back to him. He asked, I asked, he gave, I returned it. Mothers and fathers, none of us are promised the blessing of children. But if we are given the blessing of children, we are to turn that blessing back to him. Just as we talked about last week when we concluded our study of Matthew's gospel, everything that we have is a stewardship. What we've been given ultimately belongs to the master and is to be used in service to the master, and this even includes the blessing of our children. Hannah's faithful devotion to the Lord impacted the life of her son Samuel, and Samuel's faithfulness to the Lord shaped the course of a nation. For as the old adage goes, the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. So mothers, on this Mother's Day, be reminded of the importance of what you have been uniquely gifted to do. You alone can mother. And if you've been given the gift of children, which none of us was promised, steward your children. Steward your parenting. And do it all in the strength of God and do it for the glory of God. Because this is what we're called to do in all of life. Give to God what we've received from God. Sometimes we sing, every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. Every blessing that you pour out, I turn back to praise. I give back to you. Because that's exactly how Hannah concludes in verse 28. You poured out a blessing, I turned it back to you. However, as we do so, as we receive and as we return, Remember as we do that whether your home is full or whether your heart today is barren, we need to remember that our ultimate fulfillment can never come from the gifts. Our ultimate fulfillment needs to come from the giver of gifts. Friends, our ultimate fulfillment can never come from the gifts of God. Our ultimate fulfillment needs to come from God himself, the giver of gifts. If Hannah could not find satisfaction in the Lord without a child, she would never find satisfaction in the Lord with a child. Because motherhood was never meant to bring ultimate satisfaction. And for those women who never have children, your worth, your value, your contribution is in no way diminished. It is different. Because a woman's ultimate purpose is not found in motherhood, but in Christ and your ultimate satisfaction not found in motherhood, but in him. Friends, if Hannah couldn't worship God without a son, then she would never be able to worship God with a son. Because if your worship of the gift giver is determined only by the gifts that he gives, then you're not seeking after God. You're seeking after his gifts, and they've become idols. You've made them into an idol. Children, or any gift of God can never bring us ultimate meaning or satisfaction. So for as good and beautiful and satisfying as motherhood and children might be at times, they will always leave us somehow unsatisfied. Because our satisfaction, our purpose, our ultimate joy cannot be found in motherhood, in children, or in any other gift. It can only be found in the giver of all good gifts the Lord himself. So whether you're here today and whether your nest is full or empty, your joy must be found in the Lord. 
Your purpose is found in serving him. Your satisfaction regardless of what he gives or what he withholds. And we will remind ourselves of this truth today at the end of the service when we sing, Come rejoice now, O my soul, for his love, his love is the reward. Fear's gone and hope is sure, because Christ is mine. And that's where my satisfaction lies. That's where my purpose lies. That's where my hope lies. That's where it all lies. Christ is mine forevermore. Women, your role as a mother is good, and you are uniquely shaped by God to be able to do this thing. However, your ultimate identity and satisfaction will never be found there. Whether you have no children or 90 children, your ultimate satisfaction and purpose must be found in Christ, who is yours forevermore. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news to which we cling and by which we are saved. This is the gospel which we want to pass to our children. This is the gospel which we will faithfully proclaim to this next generation. The book of 1 Samuel opens with a mother. The faithfulness of this mother shaped a man. That man shaped a nation. And from that nation came the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who saves us all. Now, we have no promise in our parenting of such results. But may we be faithful in our stewardship, whatever it is the Lord has given us. And may our satisfaction be found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift of mothers. Thank you for the gift of family. But thank you most of all for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we find perfect fulfillment, ultimate satisfaction, and everlasting meaning. Lord, may we be faithful stewards of whatever you've given us, whether it be children or titles, responsibilities, whatever it is that you've given, may we be found faithful, stewarding all that's been given but we, we do so knowing that we'll never find ultimate satisfaction in those things, but only ultimate satisfaction in you. May you be our reward. In Jesus' name, amen.